Hi, Colin Nikiforic here with Cool Science, and glad you could join us today. We're at uh, our facility, our LNG pilot demonstration facility here in Calgary, Alberta, and we're going to take you through and show you uh, a bit about how our refrigeration works and, uh, and show you a little bit of LNG. Just before we uh, get started to, to walk you through the demonstration at our facility here, we'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the science. We have two things that are happening. One is we have our MA3 refridge, which takes uh, can refrigerate down to minus 70 centigrade. As well, we have a, a closed loop methane cycle, which is going on where we're making we're chilling the methane and turning it into LNG. This uh, phase diagram you're looking at is for pure methane, and in order to make uh, liquefied natural gas, you have to get down to minus 160 centigrade. We can't do that with our refridge alone. We have to chill the, the natural gas at higher pressures in the dense phase, above the top of the phase envelope, with the refridge, the MA3 refridge, and then we drop pressure down into the phase envelope, and roughly half is turned into liquefied natural gas, and the other half is cold vapor. That cold vapor the cold is recovered in heat exchangers, gas-gas exchangers, which helps provide some refrigeration as well. So to make LNG, we have both the MA3 refridge running at minus 70, as well as the, the methane acts as an open-loop refridge cycle as well. So what you're observing here right now is, this is our LNG storage and vaporization system. It's really a, a fuel tank off of a class 8 truck and I described before we have a closed loop for our pilot plant we have a closed loop methane system so when we make LNG when we flash through the JT valve that LNG runs down into the storage tank and what we have to be able to do is because it's closed loop we have to revaporize the LNG that we that we make so periodically you'll hear the the tank there's a pump that will pump the LNG up to pressure. You can hear it pumping the, the LNG. That liquid is pressurized and goes through a heat exchanger, which is the coil that you see on the end of the, the tank there. It revaporizes the, the liquefied natural gas back into a vapor, and there's a red line that is feeding into the, into the pilot facility to then reliquify re that methane again. So we're at the, the point in our plant where we reintroduce the gas into the, the pilot facility. So the red line that was feeding from the fuel tank is feeding the gas here at 100 psi. There's a regulator which drops the pressure down to about 15 psi and is fed into the system. So that's kind of the, the makeup gas. This line here is the methane that wasn't turned into LNG and was cold vapor. Inside the cold box, the cold is recovered through two gas-gas heat exchangers and it comes out of the box and it's been warmed up. This is now uh, acceptable to run on carbon steel materials and it's the recycled gas which is heading over to the compressor. The other thing I'd like to point out here is a very large uh, pressure vessel behind. It's an expansion tank that we have for our pilot facility. It's not something you'd see in a commercial opera operation. What its purpose is is that when we shut our facility down and if we've left any LNG in the system, when that LNG warms up and it expands, it has a place to expand to. So it's just important to know that there isn't a big one of these in the commercial plant. There isn't even one at all. So here we are at our recycle compressor, just in behind me here. And one of the things that uh, we really like to bring to people's attention is that our rotating equipment is all conventional uh, type of equipment. So this is actually a, a leased unit wasn't specifically designed for LNG application. So what happens is that after that natural gas that isn't liquefied, that's basically the cold vapor, we recover the cold and it enters into the compressor. It's warm enough to go into a carbon steel compressor. So that's what we have behind here is just a, 
I'm not going to say off the shelf, but essentially a conventional compressor. It's something that can be maintained by any competent heavy duty mechanic. We don't have to uh, fly in specialized uh, technicians to, to run and, and repair turbo machinery that you'd see in other uh, LNG technologies. Okay, we're up on the pilot plant deck now and we're going to take a look at the MA3 refridge and how it operates. Take you through the equipment. So if you follow over this way. We're at our uh, reboiler. This is where essentially what I call the rich Windex. 90% water, 10% ammonia is where we put heat to it. In our case at uh, this facility, we're using electrical heat to boil the ammonia. Commercially, you can use hot oil, steam, or waste heat, some source of, uh, of heat. Uh, today, we're running at about 165 degrees Celsius, and we're running at about 110 PSI pressure on the system. The pressure is driven by the condensing conditions of, of the refrigerant. That's the same for any, uh, any type of refrigeration system, whether it's your air conditioning in your car or a mechanical uh, refrigeration system. The pressure of the system is, is defined by uh, the conden condensing conditions. So anyways, this 90-10 mixture, we put heat to it, we drive the ammonia up the distillation column. By the time it reaches the top of the column, it's about 110 degrees Celsius. Those, those overhead vapors are now about 60% ammonia, 40% water. They head back towards the fin fan uh, condenser on the back end of our compressor. Then we have an insulated line, which is basically two-phase flow. Coming down to our reflux accumulator. And this is where our purified ammonia, it's about 99.5% pure uh, vapor ammonia, goes up, up overhead to our ammonia condenser. Here we're using a water cooler. Uh, to do that, it's the easiest at this facility. Uh, for our commercial plants, we're basically using aerial fin fan coolers to do the condensing. Once the ammonia has been condensed, it heads over to our vertical ammonia accumulator. This is where the liquid ammonia refrigerant is uh, located after it's been heated and distilled on the, on the rest of the system. So this ammonia refrigerant is really no different than a mechanical ammonia system where you're compressing a vapor up to the pressure required to, to condense the fluid. In our case, we basically use pumps and heat and distillation to get that purified ammonia, which then ultimately ends up as a liquid refrigerant. Okay, so if we start with a, a rich solution that we have in our reboil and we boil uh, the ammonia out of that, we must end up with a lean solution. So coming off the bottom of the reboiler is a hot lean solution, so it's about 160 Celsius. It's 97% water, 3% ammonia. It's still hot, and we head, it's, it heads over to our rich lean exchanger. So much like amine plants, you want to recover that hot lean solution energy, and you preheat the feed, which is rich, which is on the other side of the exchanger, and that feed heads into the top of our, heads into our distillation column and our, and our reboiler system. The hot lean solution gets cooled to about 50 degrees Celsius. It's still hot, so we send it over to our fin fans, and we cool it off some more. And then it comes back and it's in this line here. So this is now cool, lean, pressurized solution. So 97% water, 3% ammonia at about 110 PSI, the same pressure that the reboiler system is operating at. And we head down this way. So this lean solution is what we're feeding into the column. But before it feeds into the, our absorber column, it goes across a control valve. This control valve drops the pressure from 110 PSI. On the other side here, we're way sub-atmospheric. We're down about 10% of an atmosphere. So this valve is basically restricting flow to the pump that's just down below here on the ground, which is a conventional off-the-shelf vertical can pump. Again, all of the rotating equipment we have with this refrigeration technology is, is really off-the-shelf type of equipment. Okay, now that we've created the, the nice low pressure lean solution in 97% water, 3% ammonia at that sub-atmospheric pressure, it heads up to the top of the absorber column. That's then going to contact with the ammonia, absorb the ammonia. So 
I walk over here, these are our two level control valves that basically keep our ammonia chillers flooded. So in the configuration we have here, we have a two-stage ammonia chiller. So we have one that's operating about 10, 11, 12 kPa, the other one that's operating at 20 kPa higher. So when it's running at this sort of 10 kPa, 12 kPa range, it's minus 68 to minus 70 degrees Celsius. This one operates at 30 kPa, and it's just sort of in the sort of the mid minus 50s. So we do our chilling in the ammonia through two stages. Don't do all the work with uh, with one chiller. So the ammonia that we uh, condensed over in our ammonia accumulator, that liquid is fed to these controllers, and as you can see on the other side of this valve, it's highly frosted. That's because that is seeing that very low pressure that the, uh, the solution is operating at. Uh, the top chiller runs at about minus 70 degrees Celsius. The other chiller runs at about minus 55 Celsius. That difference in temperature is solely related to where the ammonia vapors are sparged into the absorber column. Uh, it's the hydrostatic difference in head that makes these two operate at slightly different pressures. The overhead lines that uh, you see going up to the top of the column, that has the vaporized cold ammonia, which reabsorbs into the lean solution. The lean solution becomes rich. It heads down the column and then it's fed to the pump. And the pump then boosts the pressure to get the solution back into the rebody. Okay, so now that the natural gas has been chilled, and it, uh, it left the compressor at about 900 PSI. And just to kind of go through, that gas stream first sees a gas-gas exchanger, first ammonia chiller, the second ammonia chiller, and then another gas-gas exchanger. And then it pops out of the box right here, and it's still at that 900 PSI and roughly 70-some degrees Celsius. From there, it goes to a JT valve, and that's where we drop in pressure from 900 PSI down to about 15 PSI and minus 150 degrees Celsius. So that two-phase flow goes into a two-phase separator. The, the liquid LNG goes off the bottom of the separator over to the storage tank that we saw earlier in the presentation. The cold vapor goes off the top of the separator through the back side of the gas-gas exchangers and then out and that's where it re-enters and goes into the recycle compressor to go around for another circuit. We just wanted to uh, show you we have a, across our valve we show the two analog pressure gauges but we also have a gauge here uh, where we're showing the top uh, the pressure at the top of our absorber so we're, today we're running about uh, 11 11.2 kPa absolute and that's basically right in the bubble space at the top of the column where the ammonia absorbing in the lean solution. My name is Dan Sitch. I'm the Senior Operations Advisor for Cool Science. I'm going to be taking a sample of the LNG and putting in this specialized cryogenic storage vessel. Some people call this a thermos, but for this demonstration, we're going to call it a specialized cryogenic storage vessel. We're about to learn about the insulating properties of this thermos by putting some LNG in here. LNG, of course, is liquefied natural gas and is classified as a cryogenic liquid. So as I'm putting the LNG in here, it's going to boil because this is hot and LNG is cold. So as it boils, the LNG liquid is going to be turned to an LNG vapor or methane vapor, and it'll be at the same temperature, which is at minus 162 degrees Celsius. So as that cold vapor enters the atmosphere, it's going to condense the humidity in the atmosphere and create a fog. So visibly, you'll see a fog as I'm filling this. Dan here again with Cool Science, going to show you visibly pouring some LNG into a Pyrex beaker. So the purpose of me doing this is to show the exchange of energy. You're visibly going to see the cryogenic liquid, the liquid methane, being poured into the Pyrex beaker. And the heat energy from the Pyrex beaker is going to vaporize it very aggressively. And as this Pyrex beaker, the humidity is going to cool against, uh, condense against the Pyrex beaker and uh, form a layer of ice which acts as insulation and you're going to see the aggressive boil start to diminish and go to a simmer. So 
So we have the LNG liquid in the Priorx beaker here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the physical properties of methane in the liquid phase and the vapor phase. So methane vapor has an explosive range of 5 to 15 percent. So what that means is on the lower explosive limit, 5 percent concentration of methane vapors in the atmosphere with a source of ignition you will have combustion occur. If the concentration of methane vapors is greater than 15% in concentration of air, you cannot have com combustion occur. So with a source of ignition, I will actually move it towards the methane vapors and see where that range is. So that's part of the fire triangle of having that range of 5 to 15% with the source of ignition. I take away the oxygen and part of the fire triangle the flame will go out. I'm going to take this liquid LNG, liquid methane, pour it on the ground to show you what happens if, uh, if a tanker vehicle overturned or if you have a spill on the ground. So as you can see, it immediately evaporates. So again, that transfer of energy, the heat energy from the ground immediately vaporized the liquid and the, the methane vapors dissipated into the atmosphere. I show the bottom of this Pyrex beaker all frosted up. So if you had a large spill from a tanker on the ground, what would happen is exactly this. The heat input from the ground would quickly vaporize that, taking away heat energy from the ground, freezes it, and you'd look like the bottom of this Pyrex beaker. The ground would be frozen, and so the heat input is less going in to vaporize the LNG and you would actually have a pool of uh, methane liquid slowly simmering away. So again, the safety risk of this is you have to have that 5 to 15 percent concentration with a source of ignition in order for combustion to occur. And it didn't go boom because there's no pressure. It will go woof as uh, the combustion ignites. We're going to do another demonstration that actually shows um, what would happen if we have a spill of LNG on water. And again, we talk about the physical properties that there's always an energy exchange that occurs. So that energy exchange is energy is never created or destroyed, it's only transferred. So when LNG um, is spilled on any body of water, it's going to remove heat energy from the water to put it into the LNG and that energy exchange is you reduce the temperature of the water while you increase the temperature of the LNG and the LNG vaporizes, it goes into the atmosphere as a methane vapor and what is remaining here is as you reduce temperature of water it actually freezes. We have ice. Thank you very much for uh, participating in our demonstration today. Just like you to remember that this is cool. This is a cool science. Mm -hmm.